All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is March 9th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of different ways to follow the meeting or to participate in today's meeting. To both view and participate, I'll recommend um, using the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone when we get to both public hearing items. And we okay. also have a public comment period as well. And that telephone number is 1-669-900-6833. When prompted, the collaboration code is 841-3361-2583. And this is, information is posted on our homepage if you forget those numbers. All right. We have two public hearing items on today's agenda. So for each item, we'll be um, providing uh, time for members of the public to speak. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will, part, I will um, ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link if you're connected via the Zoom link, or if you're calling in by telephone, I ask that you remotely raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. And I will remind everybody of these instructions. All members of the public will be provided three minutes to speak for um, each item on today's agenda. Um, if at any time you have difficulty connecting today, either via the link or by calling in, uh, we do have support staff with us this morning, uh, Michael Lamb. He will be checking his email periodically and he'll let me know if we needed to pause and make sure people are connected. His email is michael.lam, L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. So please reach out to Michael if you have any questions or concerns with connecting today. All right, so we are situated. I see we have our chair with us this morning. So I will turn over the meeting to our Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jocelyn. Thank you so much. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and welcome everybody to the March 9th, uh, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz Planning Commission. And the time is 9.33. We can call this to order. Ms. Drake, can you please have a roll call? Yes. Commissioner Shepard? Commissioner Shepard? Hello. Whoops, sorry. I'm here. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner schaefer Fritis. Here. And Chair Gordon. Here. I also see Commissioner Bialante on the uh, attendees here. She... Commissioner Bialante is my um, yes. substitute. Okay, that's right. So, okay, she just was added. <laughs> okay, understood. So we can proceed. Thank you. Um, Moving on to item two then, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? Uh, no, there are none. Okay, thank you. Item three is declaration of ex parte communications. Do any commissioners have any um, ex parte communications that they'd like to discuss? No. Okay, 
With that, we can move on to item four, oral communications. This is a time when members of the public have an opportunity to speak on items that are not on today's agenda. Um, Ms. Drake, can we please open the oral communications, please? Um, yes, so um, again, this is for members of the public who wish to make a comment on an item or a topic not on today's agenda. And we will provide two minutes for these comments. So if we could get two minutes on our time clock, that would be great. All right, let's see. I'm seeing, oh, I am seeing a hand raised by a caller by the name of Carol. Um, good morning, Carol. Will you please state your name for the record? Good morning. This is Carol Bjorn. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm actually going to speak on agenda item number seven to strongly oppose that. Um, there's been no studies of wireless technology on the human body. And so essentially, when we have all this cellular and Wi-Fi going on, we're actually part of the experiment. Carol? Um, I might interrupt there for a second. Yeah. I appreciate that, Ms. Drake. Um, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, <laughs> So I was just going to say, Carol, since um, your comments are related to item seven on the agenda, I ask that you hold your comments until we open the public hearing for that item. This is a time for members of the public to speak on an item that is not on today's agenda. So would you mind um, raising your hand when we get to the public hearing portion of item number seven in just a couple of minutes? Thank you. Um, all right, so I hit, um, we'll call on, we have two other hands raised, um, again, for um, comments not on today's um, agenda, um, related to not items not on today's agenda. So let's see, we have a caller with the last four digits, um, 2915. Um, good morning, please state your name for the record. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner, can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Becky. Thank you, good morning. Um, I would like to uh, just make sure that, and I'm sure you do know, the uh, draft Santa, sustainable Santa Cruz County plan is now open for public comment. And the first public meeting about that will be a week from tonight. It is in the evening, 6.30 to 8.00. This first one will have in person at the Watsonville Civic Center Community Room, as well as virtual. However, all of the others are only virtual. I, I really take exception with that. I think it's difficult for people uh, like myself who can only join Zoom meetings via telephone to be restricted. We can't see any of the... Um, slides that are presented or anything like that. So I don't know if you can please uh, request with the planning department that um, there be the option for in-person or meetings at all of the others that will be happening weekly through April 20th uh, to, to include in-person meetings as well. If not, I ask respectfully that the slides for the presentation be posted on the planning department website at least 24 hours in advance of the meeting. Okay. I also ask that all meetings be uh, recorded and posted on the website. Thank it, you, Becky. I how, will how much time do we get or? Two minutes. Your your time is up there for um, okay. general comment. I will forward your comments to um, to Stephanie Hansen, and I recommend that you email her as well. Thank you. Thank you. I have done that already, but I just want to ask the commissioner's help. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, I see a caller. Um, I um, there is no number shown. Call in user one. Um, so. Good morning, you have two minutes. And if you're muted, please press star six on your phone. Okay, good morning. Uh, good morning, this is Marilyn Garrett. 
and I've been to planning commission meetings, hundreds of them over 20 years, just for background. I'd like to recommend a very important book for county planning, development, placements of electrical sources. And um, it, since we also have a large agricultural area in our county, this is very relevant. The book is titled The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life. It's a bestseller and translated into many languages. Specifically, I'm gonna excerpt a chapter titled Bees, Birds, Trees, and Humans. And I have um, another publication by the person quoted here. It's called Bees, Birds, and Mankind, Destroying Nature by Electrosmog. And it's German, it says, it must not be forgotten, warns German biologist Ulrich Warnke, that every insect is equipped with a pair of antennas, which are demonstrably electromagnetic sensors. And the famous whale dance, Warnke reminds us, by means of which honeybees tell each other the precise direction of food sources with respect to the sun thank depends you, on their you. knowing the exact position of the sun, even on cloudy days and within the darkness of the height. Thank you. Bees? All right, and I see a caller by the name of Carol again raising her hand. Carol, I believe that your comments are related to item number seven. So I ask that you lower your hand and raise it at that time when we get to public comment for item number seven. Um, I am seeing a hand raised by Joshua Macha. Good morning, please state your name for the record. You have two minutes. Hi, yes, my name is Josh Maka. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm a father of two young children and I live in Boulder Creek. I'm just going to pull up my notes here of what I wanted to say. Yeah, so for those of you who are involved with the RTC and Metro, the message of implementing change for a better climate future has already been brought to your attention. I challenge those of you on this board to envision a Santa Cruz that in the coming years can become an example to the world of what a walkable, equitable region can look like. I feel that single residential zoning with setback restrictions and parking requirements needs to broaden to a more mixed use development approach to decrease car dependence in our communities and increase resilience. Lastly, those of you on this board have a responsibility to respond to the housing crisis, which is causing ever more people to become homeless. Expanding the types of housing and development across the county with less focus on sprawl and more focus on medium density de de development can usher in a new era with all the best aspects of urban life. Though I know change is never easy and often met with strange op strong opposition, I believe with our eyes set on a brighter future, we can convince those that are reluctant to join in with the task at hand. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, last call for comments related to any topic not already on today's agenda. Otherwise, we will move on. All right, I'm not seeing any additional hands raised. Chair? Great, thank you so much. Then at this time, we'll close item four, oral communications, and move on to the consent items. Item five is the AB 361 resolution, which we have seen before. Um, would any commissioners like to discuss or make a motion on this item? I move that we approve item number five on the consent agenda. I'll second that motion. Thank you, commissioners. Um, at this time, we'll take a vote on the matter then. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. And any opposed? Any abstaining? That motion passes. Thank you. We can move on to scheduled items. Item number six is the approval of minutes. 
um, from the meeting date of February 23rd, 2022. Uh, do we have any discussion or a motion on this agenda item for today? I'll move that we approve agenda item number six, approval of minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Freitas. Yep. And I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Lacenby. Uh, then we can go ahead and take a vote on this matter as well. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstaining? That motion passes. Wonderful. We can move on to our regular scheduled agenda items today. Um, excuse me, we're on that. Item number seven. Uh, this is a proposal to amend the wireless communication facility regulations by repealing Santa Cruz County Code sections 1310-660 through 1310-668 and replacing with new sections 1310-660 through 1310-664. Ms. Drake, do we have a uh, planner that would like to present on this item today? Um, yes. Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to promote David Carlson, the panelist here. And I see he's been promoted. Um, can we please load the PowerPoint for the wireless communication facility regulations ordinance amendments? Um, item number seven. Fantastic. Good morning, David. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. And just to confirm, as I go through this slideshow, I will I will have to um, ask for the slides to be changed. I can't control those myself. Yes, that is correct. So just say next slide, and um, staff will advance them for you. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So. Um, the Board of Supervisors had previously directed staff to develop an updated wireless communications facilities ordinance to more clearly state the rules and remove as much ambiguity as possible. Um, on December 7th, 2021, the board conducted a study session on the proposed ordinance and expressed uh, support for the proposed amendments overall and specifically for the creation of categories of wireless communication facility projects. Um, and objective criteria that would qualify a project for a ministerial permit process. The updated draft ordinance presented today contains those objective criteria for wireless communications facilities located inside public rights away and outside of the public right of way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so 25 years ago, the the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 was enacted. Um, that law was intended to promote competition and reduce regulation and encourage the rapid deploy deployment of new telecommunications technologies. Regarding wireless communication facilities, the law includes a provision preserving local zoning authority um, over placement, construction, and modification of wireless communication facilities, but with certain limitations, including that local governments shall not unreasonably discriminate amongst among providers of functionally equivalent services, shall not prohibit the provision of personal wireless services, uh, shall act on wireless applications within a reasonable period of time, and we may not regulate on the basis of the environmental effects of radio frequency emissions. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so our local zoning authority can address issues such as siting, design, and operational impacts of uh, wireless communication facilities, including designating zone districts where they are allowed, height limits, screening, camouflaging standards, and addressing physical impacts of the placement and operation of uh, wireless facilities, such as vegetation modification, grading, lighting, and noise. Um, next slide, please. Um, five years after the 1996 federal law, the county adopted an interim wireless ordinance, and two years after that adopted the wireless ordinance that remains in effect today, 20 years later. Over that time, we have process permits for wireless facilities and, tech, uh, and technology has evolved. Um, various additional federal and state regulations and legal rulings have been issued to keep up with technology and streamline the local permit process. 
while our local land use uh, permit process um, has attempted to remain consistent with these updates, our local ordinance has not been updated accordingly. Additionally, our experience with individual permits over the years has demonstrated the need to substantially edit and clarify the ordinance. Um, therefore, staff is proposing a new ordinance to replace the existing ordinance, and the new ordinance will clearly communicate the review process, and the process will be in alignment with the requirements set out in federal and state law. Um, next slide, please. Um, as noted earlier, federal law states that local governments shall not prohibit the provision of personal wireless services and shall not unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. This means that we must allow a wireless service provider to substantially reduce a significant gap in service or capacity or technology, even if service is available in the same area by a different provider. The county retains the ability to require the gap to be reduced in the least intrusive manner, and that has typically been determined through extensive alternatives analysis on certain applications. Um, the FCC has also mandated shot clocks, which are very aggressive timelines for communities to act on certain types of wireless communication facility applications. Um, and technological advances and experience with these facility installations have led to new definitions and requirements in federal and state law for small wireless facilities, modifications to existing facilities, and installations in public rights of way. Uh, the new ordinance includes updated provisions to address this evolution in federal and state law and interpretation of the law by the courts. Uh, next slide, please. Comparing the existing and proposed new ordinance uh, is detailed in the crosswalk document attached to the Planning Commission staff report. Um, some of the major changes are highlight on, highlighted on this slide. Um, currently, co-location is only encouraged in the, and in a new ordinance it would be required unless an exception is approved. Um, the list of prohibited zone districts would remain the same, but there would be some additional exceptions listed, including small cell, wireless communication facilities, co-locations, and modifications of existing facilities. Um, exceptions in prohibited zone districts would be considered based on alternatives analysis that documents substantial reduction of a significant gap in the provider's coverage in the least intrusive manner. Uh, the new ordinance includes new height standards applicable to wireless communication facilities with a requirement to minimize height um, with allowances for exceptions to height based on the same uh, exception criteria. Uh, whereas the existing ordinance requires processing all new wireless communication facility permits at the zoning administrator level, the new ordinance proposes different permit types based on the type of facility. Basically a discretionary permit, um, including public noticing would continue to be required for new non-co-located co -co wireless communication facilities um, and facilities on sensitive sites or in prohibited areas um, or the coastal zone. But other common types of wireless communication facilities would be processed as building permits or um, encroachment permits. Standard public uh, noticing would be required based on the type of permit. Uh, the, the current ordinance requires public noticing 1,000 feet around the project site and the new ordinance would reduce that to the standard distance of 300 feet for a project that requires a public hearing. Um, and the new ordinance includes new sections addressing wireless communication facilities in the public rights of way and modifications of existing facilities. Um, administrative provisions are added, um, including grant granting the authority to the director to interpret the provisions of the ordinance and to develop administrative practice guidelines. Uh, next slide, please. The different shot clock timelines reflect the nature of certain types of wireless communication facilities. Uh, Co-location um, and eligible modifications, uh, for example, have the shortest timeline for the county to act on the application of 60 days. Uh, by definition, these types of facilities can generally be constructed with minimal to no visual or operational impacts um, subject to certain criteria. The, the key criteria in the proposed ordinance for co-located facilities is not defeating any concealment elements of the existing wireless facility 
or adding concealment elements to the co-location that render the facility either completely non-visible or architecturally integrated with the building or the surrounding environment uh, using screening or uh, camouflaging techniques. So the facility looks like a normal part of the building or the natural environment. Um, additionally, the new ordinance would allow ministerial processing of new wireless communication facilities on existing commercial, industrial, or public facilities, including schools. The key criteria for these types of wireless communication facilities is either complete concealment, so the facility is not visible at all, or architectural integration, um, like I just described. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to show this picture of the public storage facility on Portola Drive, which actually has a wireless communication facility on its roof. Um, and this would be considered um, either completely concealed um, or, it's, or architecturally integrated. Um, the, a, a, a normal person walking by the site would have no idea that there was a wireless communication facility on this building. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's become increasingly common to construct small wireless communication facilities on existing infrastructure in the public right-of-way, and the new ordinance includes a section specifically addressing these types of applications. They would generally be processed as ministerial encroachment permits only by the Department of Public Works, provided they meet the definition of a small wireless communication facilities or uh, represent modif a modification of an existing facility um, that qualifies as an eligible facilities request, um, and they meet the specific criteria in the ordinance. Uh, requests for other types of, of facilities in the public right of way would not be processed as encroachment permits only and would first require a discretionary conditional use permit processed by the planning department prior to obtaining um, an encroachment permit. Uh, the new ordinance includes objective criteria for review of wireless communication facilities in the public rights of way um, that qualify for an encroachment permit only um, to minimize the impacts of these facilities um, in the public right of way. The criteria include a list of prohibited locations and specific criteria for uh, wood utility poles and metal streetlight poles. Dimensional criteria, including height and volume of antennas, and equipment are the same as the definition in federal law of a small wireless facility. Um, additional criteria for wood utility poles include elements designed to minimize the visual clutter on the pole, including shrouding the antenna, concealing the cabling and equipment enclosures, uh, flush mounted and no wider than the pole. Uh, for metal poles, the criteria is meant to achieve the same goal to minimize clutter but uh, in the case of metal poles, they, they have an advantage in this regard in that they are, they are hollow and can, be, and can house the uh, wireless equipment internally. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And I have a series of pictures here of, uh, on, the, on the left is an existing <clears throat> wireless facility on a utility, wood utility pole in Davenport. Um, actually, I believe this one might have been recently upgraded with some new equipment. Uh, on the right is a visual um, simulation uh, from this uh, Palo Alto, uh, which I obtained um, online, which shows a, a, you know, a visual simulation of an, of an antenna on top of the utility pole and the equipment cabinet um, uh, on the utility pole and, and painted to match the color of the pole. So it reduces that um, visual clutter uh, somewhat. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an image from a manufacturer's brochure of a metal street light pole that could house all the wireless equipment internally and, uh, ha and the antenna on top. Um, the, this, you know, this this image does look a little clunky, uh, not uh, exactly like, uh, you know, the image of an existing uh, streetlight pole. Um, but if you go to the next slide, I will show you an image of uh, taken right out in front of this building, uh, in front of the Starbucks with the county building in the background of a metal streetlight pole with a wireless antenna on top of the pole. And the equipment box, so the, the equipment is not uh, housed internal to this pole. Uh, the equipment is located in 
that equipment box in the background and to the right underneath the tree uh, near the entrance to the county building parking lot. Um, and what I wanted to suggest at this point after looking at this slide is in the objective criteria that we have proposed for metal streetlight poles in the public rights of way that um, it include not only um, housing the equipment internal to the pole, but the possibility of housing the equipment in a ground mounted box like you see here. Uh, and the box would be in the public right of way and, and you know, public works encroachment permit staff would uh, would be reviewing those applications and making sure that those ground mounted uh, utility boxes are located appropriately like they do with um, many other types of ground mounted utility boxes. Um, and the other advantage uh, that has recently come to my attention uh, of this scenario is that there is a new state requirement that wireless communication facilities have 72 hours of backup power in case of a power shutoff. And um, requiring all the equipment to be housed internal to the pole would make that hard to achieve because these battery a battery bank to achieve that level of batter, of backup would um, would be pretty large and could, but could be housed in a ground mounted box and, and in fact um, the county is processing a number of encroachment permits at the moment for uh, battery uh, ground mounted uh, boxes that have battery backups, um, not for wireless communication facilities, but for um, fiber uh, wireline facilities on existing poles. Um, so I just uh, wanted to take the opportunity to make that suggestion uh, during the presentation. We can move to the next slide now. Um, so the new ordinance also includes a section specifically addressing modifications of existing wireless communication facilities to fully and accurately reflect the provisions of federal law that apply to these types of projects. Um, these applications are called eligible facilities requests, which is defined as modifications to existing facilities that do not represent a substantial change to the tower or the base station. Um, there are detailed criteria defining substantial change. And again, the key criteria is that any proposed modification must be limited in dimension and must not defeat the existing concealment elements of the existing tower or base station. Um, these types of projects would also be processed as ministerial building permits or encroachment permits, um, depending on their location. And at this location, uh, which is the Ben Lomond Firehouse, there is a wireless communication facility in that um, uh, tower um, on the roof. And so uh, theoretically, the uh, a, a modification to this facility um, within that uh, would not defeat the existing concealment element, so it could be processed as a as a ministerial building permit. Um, next slide, please. And then here's here's another type of facility um, uh, down in uh, the Watson, the Pajaro Valley area. And so uh, a modification to this facility might include additional antennas and there's certain dimensional requirements um, for that, that would, uh, if it meets those requirements, we could process a, a, a modification to this facility as an eligible facilities request um, as a building permit only. Um, and then finally, uh, the last couple of slides, next, next slide, please. I wanted to just show a couple of images of uh, uh, wireless communication facilities that have previously been um, processed through the discretionary permit process. Here's a monopole disguised as a tree and um, Aptos at the Best Western Inn. Um, and the next slide, please, is another facility in at the freeway off ramp leading to Pasatiempo. And this this one is pretty well disguised and you may not even Notice it's there as you drive by. It's difficult to see. I don't know if anybody can actually identify where it is in this photo, but it's um, the the different color tree. The more um, it's a it's a different color of green. Yes, got it. Um, uh, next slide, please. Just asked. I'm going to go look and see if I can see that. It's on the exit when you get off past the Temple from seven on past Temple on 17. Yeah, north northbound 17 exit. Because I use that every day, and I honestly don't think I'm yeah. good. I've seen it. So that, but I'll go look now. 
Um, and then on the next slide, this this is an image on the left of one in right in downtown Davenport. That's the fire station in the background, and this is right next to the post office. Um, the equipment cabinet uh, the, the, is down in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, we required the equipment cabinet to be um, painted, uh, and the antennas are up in the treetops next to the light standard. I had a um, question. Those equipment cabinets throughout the county from place to place up here in the valley, we have a couple of them. There's equipment cabinets. I've never known whose they were that have really nice um, murals on them. Are, is that an option? Is that these or did you need stuff? You know? They're um, being... I, I don't know. Is that a permitted process? They're always an addition, nice addition to the community. Would you allow it? I mean, do you have any idea what? For, for any equipment going into the public right of way, those are processed as encroachment permits by the Department of Public Works. Um, and um, honestly, I, I'm not familiar enough with that process to, to be able to answer that question for you right now as to what uh, any requirements we might have for art on, on utility boxes. I had but one, um, long as I've interrupted you, but one other quick question. Um, given that they are now required to have backup generators for 72 hours, does that mean that all the utility poles or some portion of them that haven't had those because they were installed before this regulation will, will need to be retrofitted with ground boxes? The, the, the requirement, as I understand it, is that the um, providers are required to submit uh, their plans to the state for um, maintaining 72 hours of backup power for their facilities. Now, whether or not that applies to all of their facilities or, or major facilities is not clear to me. There is an exception process where providers are allowed in their plan to um, describe, you know, why they can't provide uh, backup power to a particular facility um, along okay. with how they are going to provide it. So this uh, is like a process that's just been started. So there isn't any, I understand. Okay. We're, yeah. And then um, I guess one other thing on the utility boxes. So, you know, I mentioned the encroachment permit process, but as these things go through the discretionary permit process, like this facility did in Davenport, the, the, that was a condition of approval placed on placed on this project by the planning department uh, through that process is, the, is, is treating that equipment box um, in a manner that, you know, put, play some artwork on it. Um, so, with that, um, uh, I wanted to say that overall, the changes in the new ordinance generally consist of, of clarifying language, removal of repetition, an overhaul of the overall structure meant to facilitate more efficient administration of the ordinance, uh, the new provisions for ministerial um, uh, and encroachment per, uh, building permits and encroachment permits will provide a more efficient process to comply with the shot clock timelines in federal law. Um, uh, but certainly there remains many discretionary aspects of some of these types of applications um, and an effort was made in the new ordinance to provide language that will also facilitate more efficient processing of discretionary applications for um, wireless communication facilities. Um, so in conclusion, staff is recommending the Planning Commission conduct a public hearing to review the proposed amendments to the Santa Cruz County Code that would modify regulations related to wireless communication facilities. Um, with associated CEQA uh, notice of exemption and, and adopt the attached resolution recommending that the Board of Supervisors um, direct staff to file the uh, CEQA notice of exemption with the clerk of the board, adopt the ordinance modifying the county code regarding wireless communication facilities and direct uh, staff to transmit the amendments to the California Coastal Commission. And that concludes my presentation, um, certainly available for any questions. Um, and also wanted to mention that there was two um, pieces of correspondence that came in, one from Verizon um, and one from uh, 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 T-Mobile um, that I that have been forwarded to your commission and, and we'd be available to um, address any of those comments as well. But they did come in late, so um, we're, we'll take that at, Keep, keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, thanks. That concludes the staff presentation.
Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Appreciate that. That's a really great and clear presentation on a very complicated process. So we appreciate you doing that. Um, at this time, we can open up questions of staff from the commission. Would any commissioners like to start off with any questions? Commissioner Lazenby, thank you. Yes, I have a question about signage, especially on the equipment or the um, the equipment cabinets. In the past, it seems like we always had to have signage to keep people from getting too close to those or to alert people who are doing any repairs. What is the new provision for signage? Uh, essentially that federal regulations are followed in terms of the required signage. There is a safety warning um, that needs to be posted in a particular location and there's requirements in federal law for, for that. So that that's not a um, something that the county regulates um, except for the fact that we require all appropriate signage to be included in these projects and that they follow federal law in that respect. Okay, thank you. Other commissioners? I'm just, uh, maybe this is the right time, I don't know. So the putting art on those boxes is something that will be a planning or a uh, planning department issue and you will develop some way to enable it or what What, what did you say about that? Um, the, the, the only um, definitive thing that, that I could say about that is certainly um, during a discretionary conditional use permit process that includes a ground mounting cam that we would have the authority to require um, a, a ground mounted equipment box to be um, camouflaged or painted or, or include artwork in such a way that it um, e e either stands out and look and looks great or or blends in with the with the environment yeah okay i mean they aren't exactly camouflage they usually stand out but some of them are lovely here in felton we've got some birds on some utility boxes they're they're wonderful paintings uh, so Commissioner i would Shepherd, like to see that yes if i might uh yes. so the county parks department it runs a uh a art program called outside the box traffic box art program that it it kind of runs, you know, seeks artists to participate in painting these boxes. So that's not part of the planning department, but part of the parks department. Well, these utility boxes are not going to be in the parks department purview, though. Well, they run this program to, to find the artist. That's not something that's run through uh, the planning department, it's certainly not something that we would put in the ordinance. Well, I just like to make sure that the planning department it will continue to be open to these kinds of installations. They're very successful. First noted, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Anything further on that or? Nope. Okay, great. Um, any other commissioners? Commissioner Shepard-Freitas, did you have anything? Just a really quick question. Um, I know that uh, when the Board of Supervisors reviewed this in December, that one of the comments that Supervisor Friend was concerned about was uh, trying to process these applications as quickly as possible due to the shot clock uh, constraints. And um, I just wanted some um, verification by staff uh, looking at what is before us now, the proposed document that the applicant can has to submit a paper copy as well as an electronic copy. Um, and I am assuming that both of those will be dated at the same time so the shot clock starts on both of them at the same time with the intent that um, hopefully with electronic copies, things can be processed um, more quickly. So if staff could just confirm that. Um, it's, uh, could you send me that diagram again? <laughs> We, I need to move you and A. Um, yeah, so um, we don't um, transmit the um, the applications to any other review agency other than FIRE. And so that is the purpose of the electronic copy so that we can transmit to FIRE. Um, we do take them in at the same time and date them the same date. 
and um, and we do expedite um, processing of wireless projects now. Uh, we have a, a shortened um, review time um, associated with wireless applications. So we will continue doing that. That is something that we have in place now. I think the um, issue that you may be touching on is more um, related potentially, or in addition to, you know, how we take in applications might be related to the processing level by which we process applications. Right now, we process a lot of applications um, at a level five zoning administrator um, hearing level, and we're looking to reduce the, um, the permit level type on some of these so that we can expedite them in that way as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Chair Freitas. Um, that leaves me. I did have just a question following up to the letters that we did get last night, and I just wanted to, you know, understand or confirm if we needed to address anything in those letters, or um, and if that's more appropriate for after public comment, the the people that wrote the letters may be on the call. I'm not sure. Um, I can make a couple of comments um, now, I guess. Um, I would say in general, uh, regarding some of the comments in the in the Verizon letter that um, <clears throat> rather than these objective criteria or other provisions being um, you know burdensome or inhibiting, um, you know, service improvements. What we're we're not doing that. We're we're creating classifications of of permit processes for the different types of facilities. So if 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 your proposed facility does not qualify for a ministerial permit, it, it, we would process it as a discretionary conditional use permit. So these are not prohibitions, but it's a it's a system of of creating classifications of types of projects. <clears throat> And being able to process um, certain types much more efficiently than than other types that might be in sensitive locations or the coastal zone or prohibited zone districts. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say is um, there there is mention of the CP, CPUC general order um, 95 and also a PG&E document that contains uh, criteria for equipment on wood poles and um uh those are those are very important um and relevant and i would and so staff would like time to um look into that a little bit more and possibly just um you know modify our objective criteria in such a way uh that it would be consistent with those requirements and and uh based on what i'm reading it, it seems like that would not be a, a, a very significant change in the objective criteria and we could do that um before the board depending on what the planning commission uh does today we could we could easily do that uh, before the taking this back to the board of supervisors for example And Chair Gordon, this is Daniel Seswatha again from the County Council's office. I'm happy to address any legal issues that were raised in those letters, but I think it's appropriate to do so after we hear from the public. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, if no other commissioners had any follow-up questions, we can go ahead and move to the uh, public comment portion of the uh, meeting here. Um, Ms. Drake, can you please open the public comment on this item? Yes, um, I will do that, Chair. So um, as the Chair announced, this is the time to remotely raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or by pressing the hand icon on your um, Zoom app. And um, you will have three minutes to speak when I call on you. And when I do call on you, please state your name for the record. All right, so it looks like we have a caller with the last four digits, 1192. Good morning. Please you state your name for the record? Good morning. Thank you. This is Gail Nakunam. And I just want to um, comment that 
the, this, aside from the federal guidelines, the clutter, the paint, the height, the hidden hidden towers, and the and the artwork, the one appropriate concern I did hear mentioned was signage for repair workers so they wouldn't get uh, injured in repairing these towers. We are all heavily and personally invested in what is really going on here with the science, with microwaves damaging human health and the health of insects in our environment. We are paying a price. Our health and future will pay the price of the effects. And defaulting to federal guidelines will not uh, deflect these effects. The federal government is not going to get the health damage that we are getting. We are going to get the health damage. I have four um, um, government booklets here, one from NASA and um, NASA, uh, the influence of microwave radiation on the organisms of man and animals. Another one from NASA, electromagnetic field interactions with the human body, observed effects and theories. Another one from the Naval Medical Research Institute. And <clears throat> another one from the Air Force uh, Rome Laboratory. I want to read a little bit from one, several of these. This is from the uh, NASA technical translation, which means from Russian. And biological effects of microwave radiation at frequencies of 225 to 400 megahertz that remain mystifying to this day have also been reported in the literature. Monkeys were placed in a resonator and their heads irradiated. The intensity of the radiation was such that no body temperature rise occurred. At first, the animals sat quietly. Then they became sluggish and sleepy. A few minutes later, they were excited abruptly and showed signs of brain function disturbance. Grimacing, vertical nystagmus, dilation of the pupils, intermittent breathing, and convulsions. Half of the animals perished, apparently because of disintegration of mo molecules in the brain as a result of resonance effects at these frequencies. The um, booklet from the Rome Laboratory of the Air Force on Griffiths Air Force Base in New York. It says some Soviet investigators claim that the central nervous system is highly sensitive to microwave radio frequency radiation. Several experiments have been performed in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe that demonstrate a variety of biological effects that occur in living organisms. Um, observations of laboratory animals subjected to low power electromagnetic fields showed alterations in the electrical activity of the cerebral cortex and disruptions in the activity of neur neurons. Um, exposure to microwave radiation has been observed to cause physical alterations in essential cells of the immune system and a degradation of immunological response. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And the next caller I am seeing is, um, has the last four digits, 1999. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. And you would unmute by, there you go. Hello, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I am very glad that Gail said what she did. Um, you know, I was at the December 7th BOS meeting and I think I made comments about the wireless communications there. I'm fairly aware of uh, the 1996 FCC 702 that clearly states for whatever evil reason that the only complaint can be about how it looks. So where are we at? We are being saturated by these frequency weapons. For example, in 1976, 8,500 documents were declassified by both the U.S. and Russian military in about eight different three, four, five letter corporations. You know, I spoke in late November of 2019 about a phased array antenna that is probably very similar to the one that um, Mr. Carlson spoke about that's in front of the four bucks in downtown Santa Cruz at the corner of ocean and water. But the phased array antenna where I was able to investigate and go into public works in the city of Santa Cruz and look at the plans um, describe these phased array weapons very similar to what articles described in 1976. So I think that there's a lot of misleading information being given. You guys don't seem to be concerned about public safety in any way, and you guys are hiding behind 
um, legal remedies and laws and not lawful concerns. Um, I don't know if you guys were elected or chosen, but you just seem to be rubber stamping these agendas, which is very similar to the city of Santa Cruz and the county of Santa Cruz. Um, if anyone is interested in some re a really good history or wireless, Lena Pugh, L-E-N-A-P-U, did a presentation in Silicon Valley in September of 2019. Um, even when the FCC posts information about the frequency damages, they often use averages. And averages can be off by 100 to 1,000 times. Um, in 1952, one of the 3,200 Nazi scientists that were released like playing cards to the US and, and Russia, Mr. Hermann G. Schwarm, created the uh, guideline that the FCC is still using today that is based on thermal heat. And that's based at 10 million, where biology, excuse me, bacteria can be affected at a reading of six, and human sperm can be affected at a reading of six. So I don't know if you guys need to be put on no public notice or something, but you guys are behaving like vampiric ghouls. There is so much damage going on to this stuff, and there's a lot of ways to detox it, but you just keep adding to the saturation. And it's very sad to witness. But thank you very much for your support of painting these pretty weapons with murals. I'm done. Thank you, James. All right. Um, the next caller I am seeing is um, calling user two, so no fun number associated with it. Um, good morning. Please state your name for the record. Hi, this is Marilyn Garris. Thank you to James and Gail for their comments. The reality here is that we have uh, no democracy. The problem is the corporate state. Corporations like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, rule, pollute, and these are toxic radiation emitting sites. They dictate and, in essence, militarily occupy our county and beyond. The message is public health be damned. We hear about abusive marriages, but the worst marriage is that of the corporation with government because everybody gets screwed. That's what's happening here. And the fact is there's no safe amount of radiation. The evidence of the damage is overwhelming and ways substantiated. Uh, this is telecom and local government and their joined assault on our health and environment. And with our right to a healthy environment usurped we basically have no rights. Were you appointed to destroy us and the environment? My ethical obligation here is to tell the truth and advocate for our well being. And to quote um, and, and let you know clearly no resident or child has authorized 24 seven involuntarily bodily microwave radiation trespass. We do not consent to these violations of our privacy, health, constitutional or property rights. And if we were there in person, you wouldn't cut people off in mid sentence, would you? You'd say, finish your sentence, please, or you have another minute. When you use terms like uh, burdensome requirements to the telecom industry, what about, and not unreasonably discriminate, but you are putting a burden and discriminating against the health and the birds which are dying in mass around these sites and around the world. That's the real burden. And we need to stop this. We need proof of safety, which you'll never get. 
evidence of harm. This needs to be stopped, this radiation assault. And now it's from satellites. The book I recommended, The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life, is by Arthur Furstenberg. I All think right, it should be required reading for you. Bye. All right. Um, the next caller I will call on um, has the last four digits of uh, 2915. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Hello, this is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning again. Thank you. Good morning. I want to take a moment to thank staff for really what I see um, putting some good effort into trying to make things more objective, such that um, it is it is a better process. It I I see this is not a process that we can stop, but I think that your staff has done some good things here to try to help uh, recognize that the public is affected. Coincidentally, most of those have been objected to by um, the late communication from T-Mobile and Verizon. That includes prohibiting um, on sites directly in front of homes and driveways, um, requiring there be a two-foot two uh, restriction of intrusion into the, the, the public space from the center line of the pole, uh, requiring a minimum of eight foot uh, height above ground for for equipment, Equip, um, preventing proliferation, requiring that it be underground, and requiring a mock-up and allowing for appeals. I support all of all of those efforts that your staff has put into this this good document. I want to ask that you um, have a continuance on this matter. There is so much in here, and. Um, this is a this is a big issue for our county, so please do not make any recommendation today. I respectfully request for a continuance to give members of the public who have not had the benefit of seeing Mr. Carlson's slides. I hope they will be attached to his staff report at some point so we can see them. But this is a lot, and please uh, continue it. I want to ask these things be included that any um, elements put in the coastal zone be required to include winds resistance calculations so that they are not blown down and cause fires and, and public hazards. I want to know, I want to ask that fire resistant uh, area facilities put in high fire risk areas have an extended area, not just 10 feet around the facility, but more like 50 feet or something to comply with the State Board of Forestry's new fire safe regulations um, for extension fire defensible space area. I want to ask that there be an automatic uh, ability for people who are EMF sensitive to be able to register with the county planning department so they are alerted of any applications, ministerial or discretionary. This is a real thing and it is a recognized disability. So we need to be able to know where these are going and to be notified regardless of where in the... All right, um, the next caller we have with us today is, I see Bill Parkin is with us. Um, Good morning, please restate your name for the record in case you are not Bill. Good morning, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Bill Parkin with Whitworth Parkin. Um, I was on the technical advisory committee for developing the ordinance back in uh, the early 2000s, 20 years ago. Um, and mo most of the driving factors that were involved dealt with visual impacts. So I wanna make sure that the commission is careful and the county is careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I understand, you know, I know the regulatory landscape dealing with telecommunications <clears throat> and the changes with um, federal law and regulations concerning this and the shot clock. So I understand uh, the need to update these, uh, this ordinance. However, 
Um, <clears throat> there are a number of changes in here that do concern me in terms of the visual impacts. And one of the things that we dealt with a lot, and actually one of the examples I pointed out was actually the, the famous tree that Mr. Carlson pointed out in the slide in Aptos. At the time, the tree looked sick and the, the actual trunk of the tree, which was the big pole, was really shiny. Um, and through the ordinance and through communications with Verizon, actually that tree was improved. And so prior to actually having the ordinance in place, it was a, it was a hideous structure. It's not great now, I gotta be honest with you, if you saw it, it is not a great structure, but it's better than what it was prior to the ordinance. So I'm very concerned about the aesthetic impacts. I will note that I do not believe that this ordinance is exempt from environmental review uh, because it is a project, it is, it is a zoning ordinance. Zoning ordinances are subject to CEQA. Um, there are potential aesthetic impacts here because I do think there are some weaknesses uh, in the proposed ordinance that soften some of the uh, uh, criteria for maintaining aesthetics. And one of the examples I'll give you is that currently, for instance, um, uh, so the, these structures or facilities are, are prohibited in R1 districts, for instance, but now there'll be small cell wireless facilities will be permitted, uh, which can be, uh, which the antenna can be three cubic uh, feet in volume and the associated equipment can be 28 cubic feet in volume. So you can imagine in an R1 zone district, with maybe small lots with someone with a pole in front of their house or the next door neighbor's house, one of these small wireless facilities gets put in their front yard, it's not gonna look really great. And so that's one example, but I am concerned that there's some softening of the criteria to maintaining aesthetics. So I encourage you to look at that very closely. And again, I don't believe that this project is exempt from environmental review. And just because future projects that will be developed may or may not be exempt is not a reason why the ordinance is exempt as the staff has indicated. Thank you very much for your consideration. Sorry about that, I was muted. The, the next caller I will call on has the last four digits of 1213. Good morning, please state your name for the record. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. My name is Ariel Strauss. I'm an attorney at Green Fire Law in Berkeley representing residents in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. The proposed revisions go far beyond anything necessary to comply with the change to state law or new FCC rules that apply to small cell facilities in the right of way. Because the proposed county code changes also apply to more conspicuous macro towers on private property regarding which a county has much more authority and the shot clock period is 150 days as compared to 60 to 90 days for other types of application. So county staff do have the time to get these decisions right. I understand that staff would like to make the process easier for themselves and the telecom applicants, but it's clear that many, many residents strongly oppose cell towers near their home. And in fact, I'd say most residents when there's one about to be built near their home would feel similarly and want to make sure that the county does what it can to cite them as far from residential areas as possible. Obviously, doing this involves detailed analysis of technical feasibility. That is exactly what staff should be doing, even if it is difficult. Uh, now to specific recommendations. I believe I heard Mr. Carlson say the restricted zones are the same in the proposed revision. This is not correct. I want to call out the wrong fulmination of the rural residential, the RR, and residential agriculture, RA zones, as not restricted in section 1310.660.C4, which used to be restricted, whereas towers can be 75 feet tall and quite conspicuous. And these locations are in practice quite similar to other residential single family zones. The commission should similarly reject weakening the alternative analysis standards in the same section, uh, actually paragraph B of that section, uh, in which they propose to lower the burden on the applicant from what used to be conclusively demonstrating the alternatives are infeasible to now merely providing, quote, substantial evidence. And by law, substantial evidence is in fact a lower level of evidence than preponderance of evidence, which means that the applicant must admit something merely that they contend will be technically infeasible, but need not be, let's say, the 51% proof standard. The revised ordinance must also require the county at the applicant's expense to 
always hire a technical expert to review applications or shifted zones because staff, in fact, lack the expertise to determine what is technically infeasible, uh, which in fact makes their job quite difficult. As you know, once a facility is built, the permits must last at least 10 years under state law, and later applicants have the right under federal law to co-locate on that site to increase the height and bulk even beyond what is allowed under your zoning code. So important to take a long-term perspective. I also want to point out that the commission apparently received the letters from the telecom um, organization less than 72 hours before this meeting, and apparently, best I can tell, not really available to public participants at this time, which would be a violation of Brown Act, Government Code Section 54957.5B1. Thank you for your consideration. I appreciate you taking time for this meeting. Thank you, Ariel. All right. Um, I will now call on the caller with the last four digits, 1368. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, board, for, for uh, paying attention to this really important product. This is Seth, uh, your issue, rather. This is Seth Barron um, out in unincorporated Santa Cruz. I'm really happy to hear from all the callers in that have uh, stated their, their real true concerns. I know nobody wants to hear about emissions, but we have to face the fact that it's a real problem and not one person sitting in the room would want to live next to a cell tower. I think they can all raise their hands on that. But that being said, um, I'm glad that you're addressing this. Um, and I have some uh, requests that um, the ordinance include in their guidelines clearly defined setback distances for cell towers from homes, structures, and property lines so the public can read it and understand uh, what they have to expect. And also um, to, to adhere to those setbacks, when the applicants are applying for for a project and not issuing variances just because they you can you know okay we'll give you a variance i mean really stick to this especially given the outdated data i mean 1996 3g was barely alive now we're at 5g and the technology is moving much faster than the ability to understand what it is and government moves at the speed of government, and that's not going to come up for a long time. And we are all suffering, uh, not knowing what's going on. Um, I'm, I do applaud the uh, co-location being required. I think that's a good move. I mean, put it in a corridor where it works already, um, away from people, um, if you can. And also, um, I really am surprised the 300-foot mail-out um, criteria you guys are talking about. For many homes, 300 feet is not even one home away. Um, that's you know hardly a slingshot in a field, right? I mean, keep the thousand foot notice, whatever it costs, fine. Um, especially in rural areas, I mean, it's not even going to get to the nearest to the nearest neighbor. Um, and also, um, I think that cell towers around airports, given the 5G issue is a big deal and that that needs to be also included in there. I know you have some airport sensitivity uh, verbiage in there, but um, but I think that that's uh, really important with, with the fire equipment that comes in. Uh, they may have to use radar on their final approach or commercial jets. We don't know where the airports are going to go from this point forward as there's, uh, and it's very important to keep Watsonville uh, safe. Um, and I do hope that you all do adhere to the health, safety, and welfare of our people and that you keep that in mind. And as so many of the callers uh, have called in said, that, that we want to hear you really caring. And I know you do care. So if we could continue this and absorb some more information, that would be great. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, Seth. All right. Um, I will now call on David. Wutkowski, good morning. Please restate your name for the record. Hi, sorry, I was groping for the unmute button. My name is David Wutkowski, I'm county resident. I um, wanted to offer comments here uh, in response to some of the previous callers and their comments. Um, I think that it's often represented that nobody would want this technology near their home. Uh, the reality is, is that as a University of California trained electrical engineer, 
in applied physics and microwave engineering, I don't have a problem with the notion of it because I understand the science. Um, the background on the studies that are related to this come from organizations like the IEEE, the International Committee on Electromagnetic Safety, and the C95 standard, which was contrary to the previous caller's comment about 1996, was actually updated several times since 1996 and has just recently been updated within the last couple of years. Uh, I think that it's important to understand that consumers, it's represented by the previous callers that people don't want this, but the reality is, is that consumers are voting with their dollars. Over 60% of the United States has chosen to go wireless only. They no longer have landline phones. So this creates several things, one of which is a public safety question. If you're going to call 911, you want to know that your phone is going to work. If you don't have a landline phone, your phone has to work. People in certain affected communities or even disadvantaged communities are also largely wireless only at this point. 70% of Latinos are wireless only. And again, this is, these are national numbers. They're probably larger here in the Western US. Um, three out of four renters are wireless only. Uh, people under the age of 34, nearly 80% of them are wireless only. So when we fail to build these networks and make them work, we affect people, we affect their lives. And so the allusions earlier to the fact that this is not a democratic process, I mean, the, probably the most democratic thing is market force. People are voting with their dollars. They're voting for these technologies and they want them and they want them to work. And I would encourage uh, the planning commission and the county to move forward with this. These ordinances have been problematic for a number of years. They have prevented this county from having even what I would consider to be modern technology in this regard. And you only need to look at next door and to see that people are constantly posting, who's the best carrier? My phone doesn't work, what should I do? Um, and I think that people do in fact want this. They, they may not be on this call, but I think the evidence is there that they do want these technologies. Thank you for your time. Thank you, David. Okay, I am seeing a caller by the name of Maureen Cruzen. Good morning, Maureen. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Maureen Cruzen. I'm with Verizon Wireless. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments about uh, logistical comments about the sites themselves. Um, one of the photographs that you had um, that David Carlson showed of a wooden utility pole with um, the antenna in a cylinder at the top of the wooden pole. I did just want to comment that that is a design that has been used for many years, but PG&E is now in most cases um, not allowing a pole top installation like that. They're requiring us to install antennas in the comm zone, which is actually below the power lines. So that was one comment. And the other comment is about um, the suggestion that the equipment should be either inside of the light standard poles or on a ground mounted cabinet. Um, in some cases that is not possible. Uh, for instance, PG&E often has a requirement that a meter be on the pole itself, along with a disconnect. So those would be cases that you may want to uh, just in the writing of your ordinance have an exception that says, you know, unless the utility company requires it otherwise. Those are the only comments I had, but I, I am available if there are any questions afterwards. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll make a Final call for members of the, the public who wish to provide comment on this item, the proposed um, wireless ordinance amendments to raise your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone or using the hand icon on the Zoom app. All right, I just saw a hand pop up but it's from a caller we've already heard from, Becky Steinbrenner. So 
I'm not inclined to call. We will hear from everybody once. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to provide comment this morning? Um, all right. Chair, I am not seeing any. So I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Craig. And we appreciate all the members of the public's comments. And um, at this time, we'll close the public comment and bring it back to the commission for discussion and action. And would any commissioners like to start off here? Commissioner Shepard, I see you unmuted, but I'm not sure if you were going to got something to say. Okay, I, I need to leave early today, so mm -hmm. I would support a motion. Or approval, sorry. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Schaefer-Prius. Before a motion, may I just ask a question of staff to clarify? Um, I believe that Mr. Carlson mentioned, and I might not have understood this correctly, in regards to um, some provision in the ordinance regarding util utility boxes, um, above ground utility boxes. Um, and I, I noted that one of the um, speakers in the public speaking, um, a representative from Verizon mentioned that PG&E might have comments about that. And I was wondering if Mr. Carlson could clarify if he wants additional language in the draft ordinance regarding above ground boxes. Yes, <clears throat> that's what I suggested during my presentation that we might want to uh, consider allowing the ground mounted above ground utility boxes as part of the objective criteria for these facilities in the right of way. Um, and additionally, um, be given the um, uh, flexibility to review the both the um, CPUC General Order 95 and the PG&E specs for these facilities on wood poles to make sure that our objective criteria are uh, consistent with um, those requirements. Okay. So if everybody else is prepared to um, vote on this, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, well then I will move that we approve staff recommendation um, in regards to uh, wireless communication facilities and the CEQA notice of exemption and the amendments to the County Code Chapter 1310 for the local coastal implement, implementation plan with the direction to staff to revise portions of the ordinance as necessary to address above ground box um, compliance issues are um, within their purview. And as um, suggested by Planner Carlson. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. We do have a motion. Would anyone like to second the motion? I will second that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Okay, before we go to a vote, does do any other commissioners have any further comments or questions? Okay. I would just like to make sure that my motion includes on page one of the staff report, the actions listed under recommended actions one and two. So that's included in my motion, all those actions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, great. Then we can move to a roll call vote at this time. Ms. Drake, please. Okay. Um, Commissioner Shepard? Yes. And Commissioner Lason B? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. 
Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go ahead and close that item at this time and move on to our next regular scheduled agenda item, which is a public hearing to consider the 2021 general plan annual report. Okay. I'm leaving the meeting at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. All right. Um, let's see. We, looks like we have David Carlson presenting this item as well. David, did you have a PowerPoint for this item? Yes, I did. All right. So if we could please load the PowerPoint um, for this item. And um, Melissa, before you start, David, I'm also trying to promote um, Stephanie Hansen to panelist, Steve Wiesner to panelist, and um, Matt Machado to panelist. And looks like they all went through. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. So this is the general plan annual report um, required by state law and county code. Um, each year, uh, we prepare this uh, report and the housing element annual progress report for public hearing and review by the planning commission and the board of supervisors. The report is submitted April 1st of each year to the governor's office of planning and research and the state department of housing and community development. Um, the general plan annual report summarizes the number uh, and status of general plan amendments processed in 2021, um, the status of major programs in the general plan, such as commercial agricultural land classification reviews, park site acquisitions, and changes to the urban services line, um, and also potential future general plan amendments and updates. Um, the report also includes the housing element annual progress report, uh, which presents data and information on the county's progress in meeting our share of regional housing needs and housing element programs using spreadsheets created by the State uh, Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, next slide. Uh, there were no general plan amendments in 2021. 20, um, regarding uh, general plan amendments that are currently in progress, uh, last week, the draft uh, project documents for the sustainability policy and regulatory update were published, including um, proposed general plan amendments, county code amendments, and design guidelines. Um, they're available on the planning department website, along with the schedule of upcoming community meetings. Um, and I appreciate the uh, member of the public earlier that also highlighted that in the public comments. Um, the medical office building uh, proposed on Soquel Avenue in Live Oak uh, requires a general plan amendment and rezoning to allow <laughs> professional and administrative office uses, um, and that is currently in their environmental review process. Um, next slide. Um, the housing element annual progress report summarizes applications and permits for net new housing units in 2021 in data tables provided by the state. Um, over our overall progress in meeting our regional housing needs allocation is summarized in table B. Um, 96 housing units were issued building permits in 2021, um, and they were, those were applied towards our um, regional housing needs allocation or ARENA. Um, information on the status and progress of housing element programs and policy implementation intended to meet our housing goals is summarized in table D. Um, and summary tables include discretionary applications received during the calendar year 2021. Um, the county received seven discretionary housing applications for uh, proposing a total of 19 units. Uh, six of those units were approved in 2021 and 13 units are still in process um, and are expected to be approved in 2021. Um, and what I wanted to say about those numbers is in the past years we had counted um, actual building permit applications received in, in those numbers. And so those numbers had been uh, much higher in the past year, that, but um, we learned from the state this year that um, all that all we need to include um, for applications received is discretionary um, 
permit applications for, for new housing. Um, so, you know, that, that number of building permit applications received, although not reported here, um, is probably closer to the, to the 96 building permits that were issued in 2021. Um, some of the state reporting forms are not included as attachments to this report, but will be submitted to HCD and OPR, and that includes Table A, which includes the housing development applications uh, submitted, and Table A2, which includes all the housing permits approved in uh, 2021. Those tables are really detailed and large um, spreadsheet documents, and therefore they're difficult to reproduce as attachments to this report. Um, but the information is summarized in uh, the tables, including in table B, as well as the summary tables um, included in the report. Um, next slide. Um, so taking a look, a closer look at table B, uh, this table places the 96 new housing units into affordability categories to demonstrate the county's progress in meeting the, our allocated share of regional housing needs. Um, under California law, all local governments are required to adequately plan to meet the housing needs of everyone in the community. Our housing element must ensure land is zoned and available to accommodate our share of the projected regional housing need. Um, AMBAG, uh, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, uh, develops the RENA for this area. And uh, the current RENA plan for the Monterey Bay region was adopted in June 2014. Uh, it allocates a goal of 1,314 new housing units to the unincorporated area of the county uh, for the planning period ending December 31st, 2023. And those are distributed between the four income categories, very low, low, moderate, and above moderate. Um, so thus far, uh, during the current planning period shown in table B, the county has permitted a total of 740 housing units. Um, and at the following affordability level, 72 very low, 117 low, 268 moderate and 283 above moderate. Um, a total of 602 units remain for this RENA cycle. Um, in 20, uh, I'll mention uh, here that in 2022, we do expect to see um, a lot more permits issued for deed restricted affordable units, including the Pippin 2 project near Watsonville that includes 80 units. Um, that was recently approved, uh, got design review approval by the board in late 2021. Um, and then the project at 17th and Capitola Road uh, will likely be pulling permits for 57 units of affordable housing. Um, and then additionally, there's uh, likely other projects in the pipeline uh, that will provide additional affordable units um, in 2022. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so following this overview of the 2021 general plan on your report, uh, staff is recommending your commission conduct a public hearing on the annual report and recommend that the Board of Supervisors hold a public hearing and direct staff to file the report with the State Department of Housing and Community Development um, and the Office of Planning and Research. Um, that concludes my presentation and happy to answer any questions um, as well as we have um, additional staff here that um, from the Planning Department that uh, are available for questions as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Appreciate that. Um, would any commissioners like to ask any questions of Mr. Carlson? Looks like there's only three of us now. So, um, hearing none, from Commissioner Freitas or Lays and Dean. Um, I think that just to clarify process on this, because we are going to have public comment and we had discussed a vote and I just want to confirm if we are going to vote as there is a request for recommended action to the Board of Supervisors. Correct. Okay. Yes, correct. Thank you. Um, okay, at this time, let's go ahead and open public comment for this item, please, Ms. Freitas. All right. 
So this is the time for members of the public to raise your hand, pressing star nine on your telephone or this, um, raising your hand with this um, hand icon on the Zoom link. If you wish to make comment on this item, which is the, um, the uh, update report that David just provided a PowerPoint on. All right, I am seeing, it looks like Becky is raising her hand, but I'll just confirm. Uh, you have three minutes. Please state your name for the record. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, hello again. Thank you. Hello again. Uh, thank you for this report. I always look forward to it to get a pulse, feel the pulse of the county. Um, I want to point out that the RENA numbers are going to triple very soon, and I would like Mr. Carlson to uh, uh, talk about that a little bit and what that may bring for the county. Um, hey, Mr. Carlson, you said that the county only has to report discretionary uh, applications for new housing. How will that mesh in the future with any um, ministerial um, permits that are required under SB 35. I would like um, some mention, usually this report talks about water. There's nothing in here about water. And um, I, I, would, I would request some mention in there about um, increase in water use, conservation measures that have been implemented by the county for some of these um, permit applications. Um, Will the county anytime soon be redoing its plumbing code to require double plumbing for new construction as a water conservation matter? Regarding the R combining zones, um, the, um, the Aptos Blue project had as a condition of approval a community garden. However, Mid Penn is not maintaining that community garden. In fact, there's no irrigation water or anything to it. And how do we go about enforcing those types of conditions for approval of these um, affordable projects, which is also a condition for a recently approved Habitat for Humanity project. Regarding the Nye property, our combining zone, that is where the Kaiser project want, uh, is, is to go. And um, that a new state law requires that to rezone that property for Kaiser's use, they must concurrently re, uh, find the sites for 102 units of affordable housing concurrently. So um, all of the housing that was uh, scheduled to be counting for that, like the 57 units on Capitola Road, can no longer be counted. So um, that's an issue of inf information. In the past, the Planning Commission has asked for a report on demolitions. I do not see anything about that in this year's um, report. So please um, include the number of demolitions of existing housing and also a report on the status of the mobile home parks and um, their permitting and uh, licensing because that's a very affordable uh, piece of housing in our community and I would like to see it acknowledged in this report. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. All right, um, the last call for uh, members of the public who wish to provide comment on this item. Okay, not seeing any additional comments. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, would any commissioners like to speak any further on the matter or perhaps a motion would be in order? Commissioner Schaefer, please. Yes, hi. Um, I have just a couple of questions again. Um, I want to say to staff, I know this. I'll, I've prepared these kind of reports for the state before, and they take so much work to do. So I appreciate all the work that staff has done on this. I'm going to speak directly to the um, the housing part. Um, I had a question in terms of just the income 
categories of both the Pippin project and the Capitola Road. I believe 55 or 56 units on Capitola Road and 80 units at Pippin. Are those very low income or low income? It's a combination of both. Um, and I, I don't know the specific uh, percentages, but it's, it's, it's it limited to those two categories and it's a combination of both. Great, so that's gonna help a whole lot um, in those categories. Um, yes. And the other question I have is, um, I al always get a little bit confused in terms of ADUs and where they fall when you're doing the arena. How are you addressing those, especially now that we've escalated ADUs um, and there are hopefully gonna be a lot of them? Yes, those are included as new units and we place them in the various income categories, uh, non-deed restricted income categories um, based on their size. Um, and each year we do sort of a, a survey of comparable units. We look and see what the rental market is looking like out there for various size units and um, adjust our, our categories accordingly each year um, and uh, report that, you know, report the ADUs in the various income categories according to that background work. Yeah, that was one of my questions because I, I look at like um, on the RENA table B on page 15 of the staff report. Mm -hmm. And uh, I note that um, the very low income in both, well, in 2021, there were no units in very low and only four in low. And it's, it just seemed to me like there must have been more ADUs that would be in those categories than have been counted. Right, there, well, there was a lower number overall, um, which, which, you know, reduced the numbers in almost all of the categories. You know, last year we had 142 units and this year only 96. Um, so, uh, except for uh, the low income non-restricted category, um, all of the categories went down pr mm -hmm. pretty significantly just, just because the overall number of permits issued was um, pretty significantly less than last year. Um, but as I noted in the in the presentation, there's there's quite a quite a few units in the pipeline in those low and very low categories that we'll see coming right. online in 22. Right. So it doesn't necessarily occur every year. You kind of see looking back in the table that there's some years where there's a really high production of, of very low and low, and those are just the projects that have come to fruition. And it it it, it, it demonstrates that it takes sometimes several years right. for these types of projects to come online. Right, right. But um, is your suggestion then that most of the ADUs are probably more in the moderate income category than in the very low or low? Yeah, I what I can say is that all of those non-deed restricted units in the moderate and low income categories, uh, nearly all of them are, are ADUs. Okay. And that the 40, that 45 number in the above moderate, those are all single family dwellings. Right, 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 right. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Commissioner Lazenby, did you have any comments? I, I have one question about the ADUs. I thought at one time we had said that they had to be deed restricted. And that that included the, that provision that the owner had to live on the property, which I think has been changed since then. But is there some requirement for any of them being deed restricted other than low income? There, there is not currently, no. Okay, um, thank in you. The, yeah, in the past, you're, you're correct. In the past, we had um, those requirements for owner occupancy and, and that sort of thing. And uh, those were reflected in the permit conditions or the deed restrictions, but um, that's not the case now. Okay, I thought maybe it was also prohibiting uh, vacation rentals in the ADUs. That's right. 
So that would be a restriction. It is. Yes, that's a condition of approval. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to clarify, make sure I have this right. So table B is only building permits, correct? Yes, building permits issued in the calendar year 2021. Okay, so that's why you're saying this year is going to have a lot more because all those projects that you mentioned. Right. We're actually getting building permits this year. All the construction has started. You don't count it at like grading permit or map approval or anything like that. Right, yeah. The state is just looking at building permits issued. So, um, right, not not ones that are in, in process. Those are not counted in this table. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, does this may be a more arena number question, but do these numbers as they go up over this cycle over the next couple of years, this year and next, I suppose, does that have any implications to the next cycle? Or, you know, we're gonna get closer to that number. We're clearly not gonna make the goal, but we'll get closer. Does that do anything for us? Um no. The 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 numbers for the new cycle are developed according to a, a separate process that has taken place uh, with AMBEG. And um, uh, I have not followed that process for the new cycle um, super closely. I certainly am aware that the numbers are gonna go up significantly. Um, uh, we do have staff on the line uh, Stephanie Hansen in particular that may be able to elaborate a little bit more on the on the next cycle and those numbers. Yeah, good morning, Planning Commission, Assistant Director Stephanie Hansen. Um, I think Paya has uh, uh, reported to the commission on um, RENA um, and we are expecting, as David mentioned, quite an increase in our next RENA numbers. Um, and also, as David mentioned, they'll be calculated separately. Um, the, the state potentially makes it even more difficult in that our housing inventory will have to look at new sites. So for some of those bigger sites that weren't used up in ARENA, um, we'll we won't be able to count those anymore. Um, so it'll be quite a push to kind of get to um, uh, more than three times the number of units in, in the next cycle. Um, and just an, an update, the, um, the methodology um, wherein AMBAG distributes the approximately 33,000 units they got for the whole region. Um, they came up with a methodology, I think Paya reported, and that is now um, with the state. Uh, this year, for the first time, the state has to approve the methodology. Um, they're very interested in um, a new factor furthering affordable housing and making sure that um, uh, numbers were more equitably distributed this this cycle than in past cycles. So um, we'll, uh, as we hear more on it, we'll uh, report back to the um, Planning Commission and we'll really be tackling this next year as we look at our um, housing element update. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Probably end up asking a lot of the same questions throughout this process. So I appreciate you continuing to help us understand this. It's complicated. So it is complicated. You bet. I appreciate it. Um, any other commissioners have questions or potentially uh, want to make a motion on this? Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you. Okay. So I will make a motion to approve. The or to recommend the actions as listed on page one of the staff report. Uh, we've conducted our public hearing, and we're. I would move that we recommend that the board of supervisors hold a public hearing and direct staff to file the report to the state department of housing and community development. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas. And I'll second the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Um, any other questions or comment? Be happy to hear it. Otherwise, we could move to a roll call vote for this, please, Ms. Drake. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? Yes. Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. 
And Chair Gordon. Yes. All right. Great. Thank you. That motion passes. And with that, we can close item eight of the agenda today and move on to regular agenda items. Uh, do we have a planning director's report today? Um, yes, I believe we do. I see we have Paya Levine with us this morning, as well as Matt Machado. So I don't know which one of them would like to kick it off. Hi, would you like to lead the effort or shall I? Well, in her absence, I think she'll join us here in a second. Um, she may be having some technical difficulties. Um, good morning, planning commissioners. Uh, my name is Matt Machado. And I wanted to report a couple of um, changes in our department. Uh, recently, the um, county integrated the two departments of planning and public works. And so this new integrated department is named Community Development and Infrastructure. And so there's some real advantages of these two departments being uh, more closely tied. Uh, certainly there will be, you know, some advantages of um, communication and collaboration. Uh, there's a lot of synergies here between the two departments. I mean, even in today's agenda, we had a lot of conversation about uh, public works function in the same realm of uh, planning policy. So it's a, it's a really good uh, joining of two groups together. Um, I would also like to share that as part of that change, uh, we have looked at the uh, structure of the planning uh, department, the planning area, and uh, we have um, developed two distinct groups. Uh, the first one is uh, we're calling it our UPC division, our Unified Permit Center, and uh, it is being led with a new position, assistant director, and that position has been filled uh, with Carolyn Burke as the leader of it. And then also the other uh, half of the planning area is uh, we're calling it the housing and policy division. And that assistant director uh, is a recent promotion of Stephanie Hansen. And she introduced herself earlier as assistant planning director, which is absolutely accurate. So congratulations to, to those two individuals for uh, well-earned promotions. Um, under the UPC uh, division, will be the uh, building department um, and also uh, environmental planning and um, development review, which is where uh, your group falls. And I hope to keep you all informed on any changes and updates and, and developments in this area. Uh, and then of course, under housing and policy, uh, it are the areas of code compliance, policy and housing program. So exciting times, uh, change of course, uh, we are focused on, on uh, good communication in this new unified department. Uh, we'll be working on different communication plans such as an updated website, um, regular quarterly meetings with all managers and supervisors, uh, press releases, quarterly newsletters, and uh, hopefully um, regular communications with your commission. And so I look forward to working with your commission and, and sharing information and working on changes and issues as you always do. You're very good at, at managing those changes uh, for the county. So thank you for your service. And I see Paya is, is on camera. So I will, I will give the microphone to Paya. Uh, thank you. You're muted, Paya. Mm -hmm. If I, if you're on the phone, press star six to unmute. I'm not sure. And if you're on, yeah, I can see. Oh, oh. Okay, how about now? Yes, good morning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good morning. Um, sorry for the, um, the delay. I do have two items um, this morning. One is um, we've been talking so much about the sustainability update. And I just wanted to encourage you and remind you again that that series of community meetings that I think can really serve to help um, start to walk you as commissioners through the package. The first meeting is next week. It is um, uh, a week from today. It's Wednesday in the evening. 
and um, there was an email last week with the um, the chart that gives you the location and how to sign in and all of that for the community meetings. And um, I just want to um, emphasize that there's a lot of material there and I, um, I want all the commissioners to feel that you've been supported in working through it. And um, there are a number of months in which to accomplish that. Um, um, so starting now with the first meeting, which is an overview, I think will ultimately be very helpful to you. And um, staff, of course, is available to help you along the way. So um, just wanted to make sure that you know that that offer is there and that the opportunity to um, uh, attend those meetings is starting. And then the other thing is I wanted to let you all know that I am going to be retiring. Um, and that uh, my um, last week here will be the first week in June. So we have a few more meetings between now and then. And um, I'll just take this opportunity to let you know how much I've appreciated Recording oh. in progress. Okay. <laughs> Congrats to Stephanie and Carolyn as well. It's going to be awesome. I'm excited to see this new process and, and see this all come together. I'm sure that it is not the easiest thing to do to merge two companies or, you know, excuse me, parts of the county there. And so um, wishing everyone the best of luck in their new positions and, and hopefully it all is a smooth transition. And um, yeah, excited to see it. So thank you. Um, Matt, I had a question for you on the, so are you, well, two questions. So is there any adjustments or changes for us or maybe like the public that would be helpful to know or how, like, is there any process change or anything to expect anything like that's all gonna be business as usual. Yeah, no, it, it really is. Uh, we're trying to be business as usual, uh, status quo for most people's day job. And so no change to the commission or its structure or how it's managed. Um, in fact, I would probably add that uh, through this change, we're also pushing to uh, reinstate, reestablish um, planning positions that were lost at the, the last Great Recession. And so I actually think that, um, you know, the, the workload is so intense right now um, when we're able to, you know, restore some of those lost positions from the past. I think the change that you will see is is probably an increased throughput of, of work, actually, projects and policy ideas and, and that. I think, um, you know, for the past quite a few years, maybe upwards of you know, maybe almost 10 years, uh, the planning department has been um, uh, rather understaffed in so many ways. And, and, I, and we're really working to change that, to, uh, to balance that workload. And I think that will result in uh, a bit more throughput, just to be honest. I mean, uh, anyways, I think you'll see that at, uh, at the planning commission, but that would be the only change that I see at this point. Thank you. And um, so Matt, are you technically planning director? That, yeah. And, okay, great. And that's correct. That. And, oh, yeah, I guess I kind of missed that one. So. <laughs> I, uh, my, um, my working title will be director of community development infrastructure, uh, but my official titles will be planning director and public works director by ordinance. Very good. Okay, understood. Thank you. A lot of work. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Freitas. Yes, I, I wanted to say thank you, Matt, my gosh, um, for what you're agreeing to take on and for what you've done in the past. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and as one of the longer 
um, well, I'm not, I haven't been on this commission as long as Judy or Renee, um, but um, as one of the somewhat longer members of the planning commission, I wanted to thank Paya for all the work that she did in stepping in as acting planning director, plus her previous years in the planning department. I, I know I appreciated her insight and her leadership and I hope you just have a wonderful time in retirement, Paya. Thank you, Melanie. Yes, I, I would also echo uh, what Schaefer Freitas has said, that uh, I, you've been an, an invaluable help to, at least to me and I think to the other commissioners, and I wish you the best in retirement. And congratulations, Matt. Thank I you. thought you were trying to reduce the workload and you've doubled yours. <laughs> well, that's possible, but I know that... Um, the planning department is staffed really well with some great leadership. And, you know, I mentioned uh, a bit of it and there's a, a, a lot of great leadership even below those levels. And so uh, I think that, um, I think that it's not, it's not such a heavy lift for me knowing that we have so many great staff members already doing the work and, you know, Pia's Pia will have left the department in a really good um, position and situation and, and I'm, you know, we're all very fortunate that she's transitioning out over quite a few months to help us, uh, you know, hand off some of her duties. And so I believe we're in a good position today. So, but thank you. Appreciate your, your thoughts. Hey, awesome. Well, thanks so much. Um, if there's anything else on the uh, planning director's report, happy to talk about it. Otherwise we can move on, so. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you so much, guys. Um, upcoming meetings. Upcoming meetings. Yes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, we have the um, upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Um, so far for April, we don't have any reservations. Um, it's not too late to submit re reservations, however, so you may end up meeting. But at this point in time, it looks unlikely that we'll have a meeting on the 13th. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Zazueta, anything to report today? Oh, excuse me. Um, so oh, we don't have any in April, but there's not going to be a meeting on March 23rd either. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, definitely nothing in March um, for sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the only thing I'll report is is that we're all excited about these changes happening. We're, uh, you know, I'm excited to work with Matt, and we're going to miss Paya tremendously. Um, sorry to see her go, and uh, but I'm sure wonderful adventures are ahead. Um, I just wanted to also congratulate uh, David Carlson on a on a well done uh, job today. He uh, he had a lot of work on his plate with these two presentations and he uh, he met them head on and was just uh, fantastic to work with. And I think he did a great job. So, and I thank you all for uh, your thoughtful comments and your approvals today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anything else, anyone? Okay, with that we can close today's hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you guys in a month or two. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.